Uh, we have with us this morning Dr. Neff, who is a pediatric neurologist at Children's Hospital of Colorado. She'll be followed by uh, Dr. Joshi, who is the director of the Department of Pediatric Epilepsy at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. And finally, we have Dr. Getty, who is the founder of the Getty Whole Health uh, Practice, which is a holistic, non-pharmaceutical therapeutic practice. So with that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Neff. Great. All right, can everybody hear me? <laughs> so um, I just wanna thank the organizers. This is a great conference. I was looking at the list of topics. I don't know how everybody chooses what they're gonna go to because there are all so many amazing topics to hear about. Um, and I hear that the conference has about 400 families, which is amazing that all of you have traveled here. So, the, um, so I am charged with uh, starting off this, um, this a uh, trio of talks about marijuana. And um, let me just get through my disclosures. So I do have research funding um, from some pharmaceutical companies, from um, the American Epilepsy Society and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, which actually is to study um, uh, medical marijuana in children with epilepsy. Um, and it doesn't affect much of what I'm presenting today. Um, so I'm actually gonna review the endocannabinoid system, which is a big word, but we'll break that down. Um, I'm also gonna talk to you about some prior research that's been done um, looking at both efficacy and safety. And then I'm gonna talk to you about our children's hospital experience with uh, marijuana in the epilepsy population. Um, so I think it's actually important to uh, know a little bit about how uh, marijuana may work in the brain and what we know about it. Um, and so the system that we talk about with this is the, uh, what's called the endocannabinoid system, which really just means it's the system within your body that responds to cannabinoids, um, which is the other word we use for um, the products within the marijuana plant. Um, we actually have learned quite a lot about this, and I'm gonna show you in one of the upcoming slides that there's actually been quite a bit of research in this area, um, mostly based on animal models. So, you know, oftentimes we will, people will say there hasn't been a lot of research, but the truth is there actually has been a lot of research that's been going on. It's just the vast majority of it has been within animal models, which is typically how pharmaceutical products come about, is there's years and years of research within animal models before they come um, to the market. Um, so we actually know that there are two different receptors in the brain um, that uh, encompass the endocannabinoid system. These were both discovered in the 90s. Um, the first is called a CB1 receptor. It's CB1 because it was the first receptor. And then CB2, which was the second receptor. Um, the CB1 receptor is most prominent within the brain. And the CB2 receptor is actually throughout the rest of the body. So we see it predominantly in your lymph tissue, um, which is what fights infections, in your pancreas, intestines, retina. And there, are, there is some presence in the brain system, uh, but it's in relatively low concentrations. Um, we also know that we have endogenous cannabinoids, and this is kind of similar to um, the opioid system, which you may have heard about, which is what we use um, pharmaceuticals to target pain. Um, so within your body, you have an endogenous system that has endogenous opioids, which get triggered whenever you may have an injury. And we also have endogenous cannabinoids, um, which bind to these receptors. Um, and the two main endogenous cannabinoids that we have are words that I have a difficult time pronouncing, um, anandamide, uh, and then, two, this is the harder one, 2 arachidonal glycerol, which is much easier to say 2-AG. <laughs> so, um, so there's been a lot of research to identify these uh, compounds and to try and understand how different components of the marijuana plant may work. Um, uh, so uh, whenever we look at the endocannabinoid system, uh, we actually see that these products work pretty fast. So they're actually made quickly. Um, they then activate and degrade, and degrade quickly, which suggests that these are neuromodulators. And that really means that this is just how neurons may talk to each other or may alter how neurons talk to each other. But it actually works pretty quickly. So it's something that gets turned off and turned on pretty rapidly. Um, and there are different um, doses and activities um, that can change that. They're actually synthesized on demand, so they're made when you need them. Um, and their activation can actually do a lot of different things within the brain. So the brain talks to each, the cells in the brain talk to each other by um, electrical currents, which are altered by potassium and sodium. And that's why we check these things and they're so important. And you may have heard us talk about 
some of our other seizure medicines, which are sand, sodium channel activators and potassium channel activators. Um, and this may actually work through some of those similar mechanisms. So it can open potassium channels, it can close calcium channels, um, it can inhibit something called adenylyl cyclase um, and stimulate other kinases. These are enzymes that break proteins down. So it actually has lots of different uh, ways that it works. And so it turns out it's a really, really complicated system, this endocannabinoid system. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, and actually in some of the other disease processes within animal models, they can actually see different effects of um, endocannabinoids depending on different things in the, in the animal situation. So for instance, when they're looking at activity in Parkinson's disease in mice, um, whether there's social interaction or lack of social interaction, you can get completely opposite effects. So it turns out this is a really incredibly complicated system. And I think that's really important to, to think about as we're using this, and that may explain why we see vastly different responses in different situations, in different children, um, because it is so complicated. Um, there actually has been a lot of research within this area. So, um, so this is actually looking at over the last 20 years from 1997, and this is just looking at what was published in the medical literature. And basically what we see is there's been you know, this dramatic increase really over the last 20 years um, significantly increasing around 2000, 2010. Um, it's kind of interesting to me that as um, medical marijuana sort of hit the media, we saw, oops, a little bit of a drop off in 2014 and then spiked again. Obviously, we're not through 2016, so we don't really know what that's going to look like. Um, I just want to call your attention here that we're looking at this um, in degrees of 20s, uh, which will be important when we look at the next slide. Um, or one of our upcoming slides. I also want to point out that most of these are articles, which means that they're original research that people are doing. So this isn't just review articles about what, you know, rehashing what other people have done. Um, and so what have we learned? So we've actually learned that not all of the can cannabinoids, which are the products within the plant, actually work by the endocannabinoid system. Many of them may actually work outside that system. So that makes it even more complicated than it was. Uh, there are about 400 different components of the marijuana plant, and so for people using whole plant products, it may be very difficult to know exactly what it is that's being used. Oftentimes, it's only a couple of those components that are being tested. Um, only three of them uh, of the plant cannabinoids seem to act um, at CB1 and CB2 receptors. Um, that's THC. Um, that's the component of the marijuana plant that people like that causes them to chill out and get the munchies and have a euphoric feeling. Um, CBN, which we don't really hear a lot about, um, and then something called THCV. So these are the three things that really act within the CB1 um, and CB2 receptors. And you'll notice that CBD, which is what we hear the most about, isn't on this list. So it's actually acting outside of the endocannabinoid system, making things even a little more complicated. Um, obviously, you're in Colorado, and uh, we've been in the news quite a bit <laughs> about our medical marijuana use, particularly for seizures. And I'm sure um, all of your family members and your close friends and your cousins have all been emailing you about all of this. <laughs> and, uh, so here in Colorado, we actually have a marijuana registry for uh, people who are using medical marijuana. They are required by law to participate in a medical marijuana registry, that, which gives them permission to use a medical marijuana product. And you can actually see our use, had, these are, uh, this is the use in children under the age of 18, has gone up dramatically. Um, right here is uh, where Sanjay Gupta had his weed special on CNN, so <laughs> we can definitely see that had an effect on what was happening here in Colorado. Things have tapered off a little bit um, over the last year or so. Um, this actually only goes to January. They post the registry information sort of on a uh, three months late basis, so we don't have the most up-to-date information. I actually, um, I think there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, Dr. Geddes is probably going to speak to you a little bit about um, a CBD product called Charlotte's Web, and there's a little bit of ambiguity about whether you need to participate in the registry or not for that. 
Um, and so I think that has led to some of the drop off here. Um, I suspect that there will be a spike because um, Children's Hospital, which is one of the few hospitals where children can be admitted with a, that are using medical marijuana, actually now mandates that families have to have a registry card. And so we, we've definitely seen a number of families seeking that registry card. So, so I think there's some fluctuations there from the external sources. Um, so I just want to, as we're prefacing uh, for these next two talks, I just want to talk a little bit about the difference between artisanal marijuana products and, um, and pharmaceutical grade uh, products. Um, and really, uh, the biggest issue is good manufacturing processes. And this is something that many of my patients talk to me about. This is their biggest concern. Um, so what a lot of families are using here in Colorado is an artisanal marijuana product. It's not supervised by the DEA or the FDA. And in fact, um, the Colorado Department of Health doesn't really supervise it either. They just say that somebody has a medical reason to use medical marijuana. So, um, so they're not really going in and supervising how these products are made. Um, and I think this is really important for families to keep in mind. And I know this is the biggest struggle that families have when they're making a decision to use medical marijuana. And so basically, you know, the, the difference between these products is that with an artisanal product, um, it's presumed that the CBD content is high in most of these products, um, but there could be none. There's actually nobody double checking this. When you buy Tylenol in the store and it says it has 325 milligrams in it, you know that the company has tested it and that's no different than most artisanal products. The companies are testing it. Um, but what's different is that the FDA actually goes in and double checks it. And so they are double checking to make sure that it in fact has 325 milligrams in it. And that difference, um, that is true from pill to pill, from month to month, and from lot to lot. And so there's somebody supervising it to make, make sure that that's consistent. And that's one of the issues we see with the artisanal products. Because there isn't that type of supervision over this, you can actually see differences from month to month, from lot to lot, and dispensary to dispensary. And so that, that's a big concern of our families, and it's a big concern to us. And so that leads to the actual dose of the CBD isn't known because you don't know if it's a consistent product. And one of the big things I hear from families is when they switch, when they get a new prescription, that they see variation. And so they have an adjustment period from month to month or every couple of months when they have to pick up a new prescription. And so I know a number of my patients who are using these artisanal products will try to purchase as much as they can at a time so that they have a long period of consistency. Um, the content isn't standardized dose to dose or lot to lot. Um, we've talked about that. Um, it's not really tested for any impurities. Um, so a particular dispensary may be doing some of that testing, but it's not mandated by anybody and it's not supervised by anybody. So you don't really know what else is in that product, which is very different from what we see from um, with good manufacturing processes and a pharmaceutical grade product. Um, and the manufacturing the process itself and the equipment standards are really up to the maker. And so there's nobody coming into those labs saying, yes, this is clean enough. Yes, you know, you're using something that's standardized. Whereas with a pharmaceutical grade CBD product, which Dr. Joshi is gonna to speak to you about, there's actually very rigorous standards where they've measured the content of this. Um, there's assurance that the lot to lot variation is extremely minimal. Um, there's careful monitoring for additives and contaminants, and the manufacturing processes and equipment have to meet very rigorous international standards. So, so there is a difference between these artisanal products and something that has, um, uh, has, is seeking FDA approval and is following these practices. So, so let's move on and talk a little bit about medical marijuana and epilepsy in the research. So when we look at this, there's actually much less research here. Um, you can see there's sort of a sporadic article over the years. Um, again, this is in twos instead of twenties. <laughs> so the number of uh, articles um, that have been uh, published is, uh, is much less. Uh, we do see that there's been a dramatic increase as there's been an interest from, the, um, from families and our patient population. So we are, people are listening to what you have to say and what your concerns are. Um, what I will say though is when we look at the types of publications that we have, there are more review articles than there are actually scientific articles, and that's a problem. That means that people are just sort of rehashing what the small amount of literature that's known. Now, there are a lot of people working on this, and um, there are a lot of um, CDPHE um, here in Colorado has um, several grants out there looking at 
um, at the use of marijuana in the patient population, and two of those grants are related to epilepsy. Um, the, um, the Epilepsy Foundation has some grants out as well, um, so there is much more interest in this, um, allowing this to happen. Um, so there is hope, um, but we're not quite there yet. When we look at some of the preclinical evidence, um, so this is kind of a busy slide, and I'm going to walk you through it here. Um, so this is actually looking at animal models, which is what happens before something comes to the market. Uh, we actually see that there are lots of different models and designs that people have looked at with a variety of different components. Um, and so that's actually reassuring because as you all probably know quite well, saying that somebody has epilepsy can be very different. Really the term should be the epilepsies because the reason somebody has epilepsy is very different and therefore one patient population may respond very different than another patient population. And so it's really important when we do animal models that we look at a variety of models. And so we can see that that has happened. When we look at THC, we actually see that some of these studies actually do demonstrate an anticonvulsant effect, and so that's hopeful for this product, that THC may be good. Oops. But we also see that for 10% of, pe for 10 of the animal models, it actually can provoke seizures, and so that's concerning. Um, we always worry about that with any seizure medicine, that it may not work or it may make things worse, um, but certainly as we're bringing something to the market, we'd like to use the target that has the least amount of pro-convulsant or provoking seizure effect. When we look at CB1 receptor agonists, so these are things that stimulate that CB1 receptor in the brain, uh, we actually see a little bit more anticonvulsant effects, so that's, that's great. It's gone from 61% to 73%, and you can see that there's also a much larger number of um, studies that have been done, 55 compared to 31. But then we see this small percentage where 2% it's pro-convulsant, 7% it's mixed, 20% where there was no effect. So it's still not perfect. It's not, not the holy grail that we're really looking for. When we look at the antagonists, this seems like a really bad idea. So we don't wanna, we don't, we don't wanna work against the receptor. We wanna work for the receptor. We can see that there's uh, very little anticonvulsant effect and significant pro-convulsant effect. And when we look at CBD, boy, we're getting close here. 81% anticonvulsant to no pro-convulsant effect. That really suggests that this might be a good therapeutic target and something that we should take a look at. And that's what a lot of the current research is based on, is what we've seen in these animal models. And it makes us hopeful that this may be an alternative to treatment. So. Um, so I'm sure um, Dr. Joshi and Dr. Geddes are going to talk to you a little bit more about different CBD products that are available. I just want to share with you what we've seen in our patient population in Colorado, in, at Children's Hospital Colorado. Um, so as we were seeing more of our patients um, opting to use artisanal marijuana products, we have very little research to give them data, and that's what, that when people come to us, that's what they want to know. Is it working? Do you have any patients that this is working for? And so, um, so what we initially did was a retrospective study. We were actually, uh, we do encourage our families to talk to us about this so that we know that they're using um, these products so that we can be aware of drug interactions and potential side effects. And so we just went backwards and looked at their charts and said, how is this working? Uh, what we found is that about a third of our families are reporting a 50% reduction in seizures. The gold bar that is usually set by the FDA to get an anticonvulsant approved is that 50% of people have a 50% reduction in seizures. It's an artificial bar, but that's what they look for. Um, the response rate was similar with all products. We actually have a huge number of families using a wide array of products. Um, uh, all of them with kind of catchy names, uh, so uh, Charlotte's Web and Haley's Hope <laughs> and Mary's Medicine. Um, the, uh, so it doesn't really, in, when we look retrospectively, it didn't really seem to matter what products people were using. Uh, we did interestingly find that the families that moved from out of state were two times more likely to report an improvement than the families who reside within Colorado, and so that was kind of interesting to us. Um, I think you know, there's a variety of reasons why we may see that. It may be a different population that has actually picked up and moved to Colorado to access this. Um, it could be that those families are more hopeful and therefore that there's a higher placebo effect. I think it's really difficult to know. Um, the response rates did vary by syndrome and this was really very interesting to us uh, because most of what we see in the news is Dravet syndrome, which is a pretty severe epilepsy. But in fact, when we looked across our patient population, children with Lennox-Gastaut were much more likely to respond to a marijuana product than children with Dravet syndrome, which isn't really what we hear much about in the press. 
Um, we did see uh, patients who discontinued treatment, and largely that was due to inefficacy, which is not surprising. If it's not working and you're paying for this out of pocket, you're going to stop paying for it. Uh, we had two patients who were seizure free. Now, I will put a caveat on that. So, one of, uh, one of those patients um, had only had one seizure in their life and had never tried a seizure medicine, so it's a little unclear if they would have gone on to have more seizures. Um, and the other patient had febrile seizures, which is something that we don't normally treat. So, um, so those two patients were seizure free, but they're not somebody that we necessarily would have recommended anticonvulsants to. Um, we actually saw pretty significant adverse events in about 44% of patients. Um, we saw an increase or new seizures in about 13% of people, sleepiness, GI symptoms, um, and then some rare events with developmental regression, new movement disorder, um, transient weakness, um, the, uh, you know, I will say sometimes it is very difficult to know if this is causal or not, and this is the difficulty with not having a double-blind, randomized placebo trial. These are things that could have just happened anyways, um, and so it is difficult to say too much about either response or adverse events because you don't know if it's truly related to the, med to the product. Um, we did see families reporting benefits outside of seizure reduction. Um, so about a third of families reported improved behavior and alertness. Um, improved language um, in about 10% of patients and improved motor skills in about 10% of patients. Now again, this isn't placebo controlled and so it's hard to know, was that just ongoing development? Was that a change in therapy or was that related to the product? But you know, I think when I talk to families, seizure control is the most important thing, but really a close second is behavior, developmental progress and alertness. And this is really important and something that probably should be measured as anticonvulsants come on the market. And I know there have been a number of times that we've had an anticonvulsant that has controlled seizures but has caused so much sedation that we've stopped it because it is, it is a really close second, those other effects. Um, the, I, you know, I think for the sake of time, I'm gonna speed through this one a little bit, but basically this is a survey that also shows that there was more improvement in children with Lennox Gesto from Dr. Hussein's group at UCLA. Um, we also did, I hope these, oh good, they're projecting well. So we also did, um, uh, we just recently did a study looking at how, how long do people stay on their products. And so these are called survival curves and basically look at how long people stay on their products. And um, so this is uh, broken down by people who moved to Colorado versus people who didn't and also people who had seizure benefit and people who didn't. And I'm gonna break this down a little bit more in these upcoming slides. It really has the same data just broken down a little bit. And so when we look at whether somebody moved to Colorado or was residing in Colorado, we see a slight difference in the, t the duration of time that they're on their product. So the blue line are people who reside in Colorado. Um, the red line are people who move to Colorado to use a medical marijuana product. And we see that they're staying on their products longer than those who reside in Colorado, which is kind of interesting to me. I actually would have expected it to be the opposite, because if you moved here and it wasn't working, I would have expected people to stop their product and try to move back home. Um, so it's a little bit interesting, that data. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, this is kind of a no-brainer, <laughs> but um, those who perceived seizure benefit um, stayed on their product longer than those who didn't, <laughs> and so, which is what we would expect. That's what we see with seizure medicines. I do think what's important here, though, is when we look at um, the duration that, um, so the blue line is people who did not have any seizure benefit with their product. Uh, when we look at this data, 50% of those people were actually on their product for more than a year, which tells me that this may be helping something more than seizures, and I think we have to figure out how to measure that. Um, and so, um, and I think that's really what's more important with this data is that it could be that these products are helping something more than just seizures, and so families are choosing to stay on this. It's really quite expensive to use a marijuana product, um, and so, so that's quite striking to us. Um, I think Dr. Joshi is probably going to talk a little bit more about this, but we do see that um, in the Epidiolex trials um, that CBD levels affect clobazam, um, and so I'm going to kind of go through, go through that pretty quickly so that uh, she can actually get up here and talk about it. <laughs> so, so where do we go from here? Clearly we need more research um, looking at medical marijuana products and epilepsy. I think we do have a lot of the animal research in the background looking at the endocannabinoid system, but we need to move forward with this more on a clinical basis. I think it's also really important that we have a stable product, that we understand the dosing of that, um, that we get a better understanding of efficacy so that you as a family can make a better choice, um, a better understanding of side effects so we know what to watch for. Right now, as a provider, it's really difficult for me to guide 
necessarily on what we need to be watching for because we don't really know what that is. And, as, and also drug interactions. Um, so I'm gonna pass this on to the next speakers and um, they'll talk a little bit more about that. <coughs> I think this is already on, right? I don't see the green light, though. Maybe you'll turn it on at the back. Good. Oh. The projector? Is that? Whoa. That's just my, it's just the, I don't know what the projector thing is. Was, Sure, that is the projector. No. I'm not sure it's here. I don't know what that's probably just the power. Right? No, that's the power. Who knows? Okay. It's better not to. Okay, so this is just my flash drive. I can take it out. Not a problem. So that's gone. the wires from the project, but they're all underground, so I can't locate those wires. If I had elevator music, I would see them on. We are going to, this is all being videotaped, so that it's back on YouTube for your review. And then um, what we haven't shared with everyone is all of the information, where we do have approval from the researchers, will be turned into infographics, just like your hydrocephalus after hemispherectomy so that you have easy quick reference, not just for yourselves, but also for medical professionals when you um, talk to them. I'm going to run out this evening. No problem. If you, if you want to start, maybe. Well, I can, I can um, start with the introductions anyhow. Um, I would like to thank Roxanne and Monica for giving me the opportunity to come here. Um, I'm from the Midwest, Iowa. Um, fortunately, we are a very progressive 
uh, town, I would say. Um, I was allowed to, do, to be part of the double-blind, randomized, multi-control, uh, multi-center uh, control trial for epidialics, which I am charged to talk about. Um, and I have also actually, uh, I can't prescribe um, CBD, as you know, it's, it's an illegal substance, but Iowa allows, with the use of, a, of the decriminalization bill, Iowa allows the doctors to consent and state and certify that this patient indeed has medically intractable epilepsy. Majority of the patients that are coming to us looking for it are medically intractable, so it's a no-brainer. All of us want to do better for the kids, but at the same time, all of us also want to be advocates for our patients and a sounding board whenever we see that maybe it's not helping, why would you continue something for a year or more, as Dr. Nup said, for epilepsy, clearly the numbers are not going down. Um, so I was going to touch a little bit about that, on that um, in, um, in the upcoming slides, and it looks like somebody is up, coming up here to help, so I will stop talking just for a bit. I have 15 minutes to cover um, everything that I have to cover. Um, and as you know, less is more, so I expect to be talking more during the panel um, and less during the slides. So if I zip through the slides, I apologize, but that's because it's um, a minute per slide, so about 15, 20 slides. Sorry. That's okay. I got some extra time, so. <laughs> so, so my PowerPoint is up here. So that's the X if you want to just X out. And if you want to restart. Is it that function, whatever that is? Oh, now I don't have a password to this. Somebody does. Coming up. Oh, but I don't want that. I want it to be the whole. Uh, okay, so would that be the entire thing? Correct. Perfect. Okay, I was just going to go to that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Hopefully. Please. All right. Okay. So um, the title of my talk, and I find that this title is pretty popular, so I've kept it. Um, it's <laughs> Reflections and Adding Oil to the Fire. The fire, obviously, is epilepsy. And um, these are my reflections. So whatever um, problems there are with the reflections, they are mine. Um, so my charge from the organizers, and this is ad verbatim, <coughs> I was asked to talk about epidiolics. What is it? How is it derived? Its efficacy in studies so far, and how long a wait before families can access it? I think that's a question that I will probably not be able to answer definitively and honestly today. Why wait for Epidiolex versus try Charlotte's Web or a similar tincture now? Now, so the interesting thing is nobody is asking, does it work anymore? And as the, as the Indian mythology, according to Indian mythology, this person here, I don't know if, oh, the mouse doesn't work. Um, this is Lord Shiva, who is the destroyer, had, I, I, frequently say had anger issues, and his wife would give him a concoction of pot called pang um, to drink. Now, I don't know that Shiva had epilepsy. Epi Shiva continued to take pang for a long time for tempering him down. Um, so Indian mythology has talked about cannabis for a very long time, but not necessarily the use of cannabinoids for epilepsy. So therefore, the objectives are the audience will know what epidiolex is and be able to review published literature on the effectiveness of epidiolex. My disclosures are that this is a non-FDA and illegal product, and I am the site PI for GW studies for lennox gastro syndrome for um, Dravé. I have a total of 21 patients that are taking products from GW in a variety of forms. Of these, 14 are in the study. Six have been in what's called the compassionate use open label extension. So my first contact with GW uh, was in September 2013. Remember now, this was very, very close on the heels of Dr. Sanjay Gupta's August 2013, why um, I changed my mind on weed, CNN special. 
And um, immediately, every person that walked through the door in the clinic wanted, wanted CBD, or wanted whatever that other child had taken, Shala Twiggy had taken. So I called um, England, and at that time, um, GW, by the way, stands for Dr. Guy and Dr. Little, who are pioneers and started producing these plants for medicinal purposes in 1998. So this company goes quite a ways back in research and development um, in the production of cannabinoids for medicinal purposes. And sadly, they declined. They said, well, no, thank you. We have multiple trials in the pipeline using epidiolex that are going to be coming up in the United States. And so um, we are interested. We feel sorry for your patient, but we cannot give it to you on a compassionate basis. And at that point in time, um, for a variety of reasons, legal and otherwise, and hospital policy, I was unable to prescribe or to give my patient any other form of cannabinoid. Um, how do these people cultivate or how do they breed epidiolex? What is epidiolex? It is 99% purified CBD, which is maintained at that composition from plant to plant because the researchers genotype certain, certain plant seedlings. And they do that by using the four loci that are shown here. Um, and resorcinic acid is the phenolic precursor. And then that moves down to the geronyl pyrophosphate and eventually to the variety of cannabinoids that are on the extreme right hand side. These genetic clones of seedlings are maintained in a very highly secure, computer controlled climate, moisture, light, and air movement. Now, some people in Iowa who are farmers had said, oh, it's, what's, what's the big deal? I could put some seedlings in my backyard, and I could also cuttings in my backyard, and I could also grow cannabinoids. And, I mean, what's the big deal about wanting a certain product? Well, the big deal is that from lot to lot, plant to plant, depending on how much moisture, how much temperature, how much air, the plant will change how much THC, how much CBD, how much THCV or CBDV, or a variety of cannabinoids it will make. In addition, this company, because it's a pharmaceutical company, undergoes repeated periodic testing of the products to make sure that the composition remains exactly the same from lot to lot. So the journey, obviously, has to be from anecdotes to a clinical trial. And the anecdotes that the media had published for everybody to see was with Charlotte Figi, which is um, on the extreme on your right, for me, the anecdote started with my patient with fires, and you see the EEG here, and it's, it's easy to see there are spikes everywhere. This patient is in a burst suppression coma, which means that there are, there is the burst and there is the suppression, and despite that, a seizure is taking off on the extreme right. And so at that time, although GW said, no, thank you, not for your Jabe, they said yes for your fires patient, and that's how I started getting some access to GW. Uh, GW supplied epidiolex. The next patient I was able to use it on was a patient with malignant migrating partial seizures of infancy. It's an absolutely devastating condition. That patient went seizure-free for six months. Obviously, these anecdotes do not then apply in a wide fashion, and we still needed a clinical trial. So like me, there were multiple centers in the United States that had been able to access GW for their uh, GW product. I'm going to call it Epidiolex. That's how they're going to market it. Uh, for their patients. And Dr. Oren Demitsky and group, then I'm not on that author list. My patients were not in this list at the time. Um, and then in Lancet Neurology in March, they published results from what's called open label, which means all these patients get epidiolex, so it's pharmaceutical standard CBD, and results from these patients were then published. So whenever you are doing an open label trial where the patient knows what they are getting, the doctor knows what they are getting, as a doctor in good faith, I want my patient to get better. And I say, look, look, isn't she, isn't she or isn't he looking more alert today? The patient says, yes, I believe the patient looks alert today. This is called placebo effect. Okay? And we know, and Dr. Nupp has shown in her study, that pediatric patients are much more prone, even in randomized controlled trials, to placebo effect at a rate of 19% compared to adult. And this is published literature. Okay? So therefore, from an open label study, you really cannot talk about efficacy. What you can talk about is safety and tolerability of the product. And then you can talk about efficacy. So 214 patients were enrolled. If the patients did not have a 12-week follow-up, they were dropped from analysis. However, they were maintained in the safety analysis. So out of the 214 patients, 52 did not complete. And so 162 were involved in safety. Can everybody hear me? This way I can point with my fingers then. And then 25 were excluded 
because what these researchers did is that they decided they would only count motor seizures. Now, what are motor seizures? So these are tonic, tonic clonic, atonic, big myoclonic. They did not count small myoclonic jerks, which could be eyelid myoclonus or absence, because it is very easy to misclassify them. It is very easy to miscount them. Okay, so this was their way of making sure that they are counting correctly and 137 patients were included in that final analysis for efficacy. This data was collected uh, across 11 centers in the United States from January 2014 to January 2015. The dose was standardized. So this was sesame oil dispensed epidiolex at the, at the dose of 25 milligrams per kilo. It comes as 100 milligram per ml solution. You know exactly how much you're giving, whether you give one drop or whether you give 0.5 ml to the patient. Okay? And only 48 patients were allowed to get up to 50 milligrams per kilo, but at the end of 12 weeks, only 19 patients were above 25 milligrams per kilo per day. So the majority of the patients across 12 weeks got approximately 22.7 milligrams per kilo per day of epidiolex. So if you look at the responder rates, overall, everybody talks about 50% seizure reduction. 39% patients had a 50% seizure reduction in motor, countable motor seizures. 21% patients, the seizures reduced by 70%, and in 9% patients, seizures reduced by 90%. Now, I, you know, off the record, this looks very much like BNS data to me. So if you've looked at what the numbers Cyberonics will give you, it looks very much, because we say in 40% to 50% patients, your seizures will reduce by about 50%. In about 10%, your seizures are going to reduce by more than 90%. I would love my patients to be in that 10% group though, right? Okay, so if you look at the results more carefully, what, what we did, and this is a little busy, I will walk you through each part of the slide. So what they calculated was the median monthly seizure at baseline. At baseline, the median monthly seizure frequency of motor seizures was 30 per month in this group of patients. Now, this is a wide group of patients. Some of them had Dravet, some of them had Lennox Gesto, some of them had tuberous sclerosis, some of them had cortical dysplasia. It's all comers, okay? And at 12 weeks, the median monthly seizure frequency was 15, so it's cut by about half, okay? If you look at how it happened at baseline, four weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks, we started patients at two to five milligram per kilo per week, and then every week increased it till they hit 25. So if I start at five per kilo, next week 10 per kilo, next week 15, it's going to be five or six weeks before my patient hits that 25 milligram per kilo per day mark, right? So therefore, what they did is they divided results by how much improvement at four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, and so on, and they found that the majority of the improvement was seen in the first four weeks, but then maintained. Now, interestingly, the seizure counts dropped, and if you look at that last four-week period, when some patients finally had reached their therapeutic dose, 15 patients had no measurable motor seizures, and five patients had no seizures at all, okay? So that's what that curve is showing. So adverse events, 79% patients had adverse events. So because it is natural, it is safe, is not true. Now, what are the adverse events like? They are somnolence, diarrhea, possible fatigue, upper respiratory tract infection, and in a clinical study, if I randomize a patient, if I get consent from a patient, the patient walks out the door, hits their head on the, on the, you know, on the frame, gets a, gets a head injury, that's an adverse event, even if the patient has not gotten any medicine. So what is critical to know is if it is an adverse event, is it related to drug use? or is it just an adverse event that all of us, by, by rule, have to put down? So, out of, and I'll, I'll go through that too. Serious adverse events, which were related to CBD, happened in 30%, in 48 patients out of these 137. Five patients discontinued because of a serious adverse event. There was one death, it was not related to CBD, it was probably SUDEP. So, what, what are the adverse events and what's the breakdown, okay? So if you look at the adverse events on the top, remember, close to 80% of the patients have this. And it's somnolence, decreased appetite, diarrhea, fatigue, convulsion. Now, that's a biggie. Now, why? Why? Convulsion, why? Why status? Okay? Because as Dr. Nupp pointed out, in all preclinical studies, CBD has no pro-convulsant effect. So is it because these patients are the hardest of the hard patients, and they would have seized no matter what I did, 
and gone into status. Remember, there were Dravet and gas to patients. Or is it actually CBD that is causing them disease? We do know that in the patients that had status epilepticus, their concomitant medications had not been reduced, or their CBD had not been reduced. So it just happened. Now, 11 patients had increased liver function tests. One had hyperammonemia, had to stop CBD. Five patients had low platelet counts. Anybody that had low platelet counts, high liver function tests, most times was in valproic acid as a co-medication. Any patient that was fatigued, I had a patient that was sleeping 13 hours of the day, they were on clobazam as a co-medication. So this also tells you that just because it is safe, it is not okay. It does interact. These CBD or cannabinoids, they interact with CYP34 and CYP2C19, which are enzyme enzymes that are also involved in the metabolism of drugs like clobazam and Depakote, which all our patients are on, and so it is important to remember. So interestingly, what they also found was the higher the CBD dose does not mean the higher the sedation. So sedation was separate, but, the high, but if CBD more than 15 milligram per kilo is used, and if you are on clobazam, you're sedated. If CBD more than 15 milligram per kilo is used, you're likely to have diarrhea. Now remember, CBD is suspended in oil, and oil, anybody that's been on the ketogenic diet with MCT, medium chain triglycerides, knows that diarrhea is a common side effect. Okay, so now we come to the meat of the matter. GW, these are phase three clinical trials. So at the same time that the open label data was out, people were also enrolling patients. In the fall of 2014, I started enrolling patients into the Dravet syndrome, and in early spring of 2015, I started enrolling patients into the lennox gastro syndrome. These were double blind. I did not know what the patient got. The patient did not know what they got. These were placebo controlled. This was multi-center, so I wouldn't say, oh, because I have an in into this. I'm going to supply 30 patients out of the 50 of the entire group. So it is distributed across centers. The dose was determined by a data safety monitoring committee, which was separate from us, from the researchers. So someone else told us what dose should be given to the patient and what dose is safe to be given to the patient. In, on March 14th, the GW Pharmaceuticals released the results of the study. This is not yet published. Now remember, if one has to go through rigorous data analysis where somebody looks at status and says, explain why status, as in the open label, similarly, all of this should go through a rigorous peer review process. It has not happened yet. This is what GW has released to the media and to the press. But what is it? There were 120 patients that were randomized. Epidiolex was used at a dose of 20 per kilo. Average age of patients in the Dravet syndrome group was 10. All of them were on an average of three medications, had already failed four medications. They had at least 13 motor seizures, motor countable seizures per month. Eight patients discontinued because of side effects. Now remember the side effects are somnolence, which majority of the anticonvulsants will give you, decreased appetite, fatigue, urinary tract infections, convulsions. So what, how do you classify this? 61 patients were randomized to epidiolex, 59 to placebo. The median reduction in monthly seizure frequency. So what we did was they calculated at the first four weeks in the trial how many seizures. And people had to call in to IVRS, which is the interactive voice response system, every night. Okay? And if they did not call in, if they were not 90% compliant, they were out of the study. So parents had to call in every night and say, my child had so many motor seizures today, and so on and so forth. And this happened over 12 weeks. And the number of, the, so the percentage of seizure reduction was 39% from baseline, and that can be a big change in a patient's life. Versus 13%, so this is a p-value of 0.01. This is a significant result. And serious adverse events obviously are associated with epidiolex use, 10 versus 3. As far as the Lennox Gesto, this is hot off the press. This only came out June 27, 2016. 171 patients were randomized. These are older patients because average age is 15. Now what we counted was potential drops. I can have a tonic drop. This, this is not a tonic. I can have a tonic drop. I could have a myoclonic drop. I could have an atonic drop. Or I could have a generalized tonic-clonic seizure with a drop. No patient, these patients didn't need to fall to the ground. No families will allow their kids to fall to the ground, but that's what we were, what we were counting. Adverse events were seen in 86%. 12 patients discontinued. There was one death thought to be pseudo. So how does this look? It's not working? Oh, no. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. 
So if you look at how these then randomized, 86% randomized epidiolex, 85 to placebo, there was a 44% reduction in the median drops from baseline compared to 22, this is a p-value of 0.01. So once again, very significant. Serious adverse events, once again, seen more with epidiolex than the placebo. So the last question was why not tinctures? So FDA actually randomly went and raided over-the-counter dispensaries, and in eight out of 16 of the products that were analyzed, CBD wasn't even present in what they were selling. I think that should be enough to answer the question, why not other tinctures? <coughs> Final notes, why is it worthwhile waiting for epidiolex or any other substance which is FDA approved? Because I think all of us mean good for our patients. All of us want our patients to do well. However, frequently what starts as a great cause is at a high risk of becoming a business and eventually a racket. And I do not want my hopeful parents to fall into that trap. Sensationalized media anecdotes tend not to provide a rational denominator to not report failures. That child of mine that was in the ICU with a platelet count of 3,000 or had high liver function tests is not going to make it into the media. Okay? Media anecdotes, therefore, should not be the basis of widely applicable decisions and it is worthwhile waiting for an FDA approved product. Thank you. So this is for the video recording and that's for my Okay. All right. Is that looking okay? This is the Good. I think maybe I can maybe I can. Okay. I'll probably just stand here. Wonderful. Is this picking up? This one on. Maybe I should use this one. How about this one? Okay. All right. So I know we're near the end of the session. I am uh, so appreciative to be here presenting at this forum uh, following Dr. Snuff and Yoshi. And I just have this one slide that I'm going to leave up. And I'm going to try to cover certain points in about 10 minutes to give you a um, kind of an overview of what I've been seeing in my clinical practice uh, in guiding parents and children to use cannabis oils for epilepsy. So I am Dr. Margaret Getty. I am a medical doctor in practice in Colorado. My, um, I'll just talk briefly a couple sentences about my path into cannabis medicine. I am a pathologist and researcher by original training and my PhD is in chemistry. And I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a while. And uh, I actually, about 12 years ago, made the decision to go into alternative medicine, looking at non-pharmaceutical uh, approaches to um, various health issues. And I didn't know anything about cannabis as medicine at that time. But then when, uh, in 2009, medical marijuana started to become big in Colorado, 
I made the decision to start seeing patients for the medical marijuana evaluations. And um, I'm sorry, I'll take a breath. I guess I got a little bit wound up with the conference. <laughs> um, but so um, I just decided to start uh, seeing patients and I started asking uh, adult patients at that time about their experiences using medical marijuana. And at that time, I um, started becoming very, very interested in the long list of benefits that patients reported and then the known lack of toxicity as a general statement for cannabis. So literally people can't die at all. You, you, can't, you literally can't die from eating cannabinoids, even though you can certainly have adverse effects. So I was quite taken by the long list of benefits people reported and the safety profile. So I dedicated my practice since 2010 full time to cannabis medicine, which means I see people in my practice who are using marijuana and in 2013, uh, we started seeing a lot of children as well for epilepsy because I was one of the few doctors in Colorado who would be willing to see children for uh, cannabis use. I guess maybe I should have kept my cup of water. <laughs> oh good, is that on? Okay, oh good. Okay, so my experiences are coming from quite a different side than Dr. Nuts and Dr. Yoshi. Dr. Yoshi, of course, is working with uh, product and FDA development and being able to participate in randomized control trials. Dr. Nup at the university is seeing many of the same children that I see. We have many patients in common, as it happens. Um, the way things are legally currently, uh, you know, most doctors in sort of um, institutional practice or in general practices are uh, find that uh, they're not able to discuss cannabis or do cannabis recommendations for their patients because of all the federal laws and the context. So I had made a decision to focus on cannabis medicine and uh, made a decision to work with patients to try to track what they're using and track their results and try to find a process to give them their best results. So I'm coming at this from clinical experience and not randomized trials or um, control trials. So. That brings us into um, uh, quite a, a, a complicated situation, like Dr. Nup and Dr. Yoshi were explaining, where um, doctors literally are not allowed to prescribe cannabis products, as you know, unless except for the very few uh, FDA-approved ones. So I'm literally not allowed to prescribe the cannabis, which means that as a physician, I really don't have any control over what the patients are obtaining or using when we're talking about medical marijuana. So a big area of focus in my practice in following these patients has been to work out ways to know what they're taking. And this is such a huge area of difficulty, as both Dr. Nava and Yoshi mentioned, because we don't have consistent preparations. So with my adult patients, many of them can just report to me about this type of strain, I'm using this type of edible. We try to document their doses of milligrams and do our best. With the kids with epilepsy, we find that the dosing needs to be the very most precise. And I insist for them that they use only oils that do have a lab report to come with them. So even though we have inconsistency batch to batch, at least we know for each bottle what's actually in it. And that's the information I use to track what they're using. I say, you know, how many milliliters are you giving? What's the potency in the oil based on our lab report? And then we can track their results based on that. So we're right in there trying to work with the families and we don't have the benefit of the consistent and standardized products. So the results that I see, um, I, I, it's quite a, a, a contrast actually from some of the data we've seen, which is um, actually for seizure control, the efficacy numbers definitely fall in the ballpark of what Dr. Nuck was talking about in the study where they had followed children in their practice and published about a third, uh, 50 a third uh, of patients getting 50% reduction in seizures. Um, I've worked over time to try to improve that number for my patients. So when I look at my patients, they're not, um, everybody is treated differently. Everybody ends up getting a different program. So if you are evaluating a specific dose across the board with everyone, I think you're gonna get a different efficacy than if you can fine tune and customize the dosing for each patient. 
And so that is, I'll just mention some of the principles that I worked out in my practice as far as how to do that process with each patient. So again, I'm coming not from the side of doing a study and documenting the data, but of working with each individual patient on getting their best result. So I want to mention a couple of points of contrast in what we've learned. One is that it, was, it's, it is very interesting to see the data that uh, CBD in animal studies has shown no proconvulsant effect. Because in the products that the parents are using that generally have a combination of cannabinoids, often high CBD, low THC, they work with other products as well, we definitely find that too much CBD in a milligram dose per day can cause more seizures. This is my clinical experience. This is the first thing I tell every parent. Too much CBD is going to cause more seizures. So that's, again, in contrast with the animal studies we heard about. And again, the products are different. The combinations of cannabinoids are different. So these are all kind of the details or the, the, the principles we need to work out. So I do explain that there seems to be a real value in the idea of a sweet spot on the dose, where we need to find the dose that's enough, but not too much because if too much can cause more seizures, if you move into too high dose too quickly, you may never find your optimal dose. It may be below even where you started. So that's one thing that I teach uh, patients in my practice. We do find that individuals really do need different doses to get their best effect. Some patients can literally tolerate no more than 10 milligrams per day of CBD, of cannabidiol and they find their best benefit by adding other cannabinoids, including THC. So in comparison then, when we looked at Dr. Yoshi's uh, data, in the Epidiolex trials, they moved up to 25 to 50 milligram per kilogram per day. So this would be a dose that's in the hundreds of milligrams per day. Uh, a, 40, a 20 kilogram child might be getting 400 milligrams a day, whereas if someone else can only tolerate 10 milligrams a day, and, and have more seizures after that, then you can see that if you have a set uh, protocol, you may, may well lose a lot of the patients or lose some of the benefits they could have gotten. So, and also another, another thing we found is that the effect of a given cannabis dose, given day by day, um, doesn't really fully manifest or build up clinically in our observations for about three weeks. It's a relatively long time period to steady state compared to many of the medications. And I do, the, the, the explanation for this is that the cannabinoids are oily in their chemical nature. They interact with the body more slowly. And a lot of people are familiar with the idea that THC or cannabinoids actually clear out of the tissues relatively slowly. Like if somebody's getting a drug test, they might have to wait three or four weeks if they've been using cannabis for it to clear out. So the flip side of the same coin is that the same dose takes about three weeks in our experience to fully build up. So if you're actually increasing your dose every week um, and going to a high level, you can actually get ahead of yourself and pass your sweet spot up before you realize it. So again, these are very different principles from what the other doctors talked about, but this is what we're learning in clinical practice, working with each patient. And Okay, so really I think those were the main things I wanted to point out, that when we're working in clinical practice, it's this whole other world where we don't have um, standardized preparations. As a physician, I need to work really hard to find out what each person's on. I can't always do that, you know, it's, it's not a standardized process. But what we've learned is that when you start at a low dose and you go up slowly, you can often find an area where the patient's getting a lot of benefit at a dose that's relatively low and then we find that combinations of cannabinoids can really help with this as well. So um, then the information there just uh, points out that I am, uh, my, uh, my main practice is in Colorado Springs at Vibrant Health Clinic. The name of my uh, medical practice is Getty Whole Health. And with so much interest in using CBD and cannabis for epilepsy, we certainly, my practice certainly has been overwhelmed by requests and we're booked out uh, two months or I think even three for pediatric appointments at this point, um, where people are coming and wanting to uh, screensaver, they're uh, wanting to uh, get the guidance to be able to find out how to use the cannabis oil. So what I tell people is, I don't know your dose. I don't know your best effective dose. Everybody really is different. 
<clears throat> but I do have a process to find out what your best dose is. And it's to start low, it's to go slowly, to change one thing at a time, to track your seizures carefully, because otherwise, you know, if you're not tracking your seizures, you don't know if it's working. Sometimes parents come and they say, we've been using the CBD, and our seizures are worse, but we're staying the course. I say, well, if it's not working, it's not working. Um, so, and often, especially when people come in and say, well, it worked at first, but then the seizures came back, so we've been increasing the dose. I tell them, it's not that you're not on enough. It may be that you're on too much. And very often when people come in, one of our first steps will be to go to a lower dose and give that time to build up and have its effect and then go from there tracking the seizures. So uh, because I'm not able to serve all of the people who are interested in using this product, I did develop the course that was listed there, How to Use Cannabis Oils for Epilepsy. It's a telecourse. Anybody can take it. It's obviously not medical advice. It's not a doctor-patient relationship, but it's medical information and teaching. And that course is uh, accessible through the Vibrant Health Clinic. Dot com website. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So those are the things I wanted to say. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you.